In this interview with atmospheric scientist Dr. Ewan Nisbet, we discuss how measurements of atmospheric methane are sending a signal that indicates large wetlands are turning on as a feedback to human-induced climate heating. This effect is causing a climate termination event. This is the name given to abrupt changes in the Earth's climate, such as the end of ice ages. In the abrupt phase of termination events, changes occur on a decadal as opposed to century timescale. To hear full episodes much earlier, as well as additional content, please consider joining via Patreon or YouTube. Thank you. Ewan, I want to start by asking you about methane in general. We're hearing a lot more talk about methane now as levels are rising. What are the broad comparisons between methane and CO2 in the atmosphere? Methane's a perfectly normal part of the atmosphere. And for ever since life began, really, it's been an important part of making the planet habitable. It's a strong greenhouse gas and molecule for molecule or weight for weight, it's much stronger than CO2. But the difference is it's actually destroyed in the atmosphere over a period of roughly a decade, depending on which way you count it. And uh, it's oxidized to CO2 and water. Uh, methane is CH4. Oxidize that, you get H2O and CO2. Um, and then it, um, it effectively, be- the carbon it becomes CO2. So for this period, this lifetime of about 10 years, it's, it's much, much stronger uh, greenhouse warmer. Now, in the natural atmosphere before humans came along, there was, in ice ages, about 350 parts per billion of the atmosphere. That's not very much. It was methane, but it was important. And in the the interglacials, the warmer periods, which was like the natural climate, uh, say, in the Roman Empire, it was about 700 to 800 parts per billion. Now, we came along, and we pushed that up by burning wood and then burning coal, and all sorts of other things and modifying the biosphere. And we've now pushed that up to 1920 parts per billion. So we've gone from, say, 750 to 1920. That's a really very large increase. In terms of global warming, obviously methane's not as important as CO2. Now, CO2 is going to be in the atmosphere for centuries. And methane has this short-term hit, but then it just converts to CO2. And there are various different ways in which you can count the global warming impact of methane. Over the recent past, it's almost half as important as as CO2, depending on how you count it, because it has other knock-on effects on other gases. Over the very long term, of course, it's the CO2 that's the big driver. We're very interested in methane because you can do things quickly in it. There are all sorts of things that make methane, and there's a variety of things that destroy methane. And figuring out that budget is a very tough problem. Okay, you mentioned the word budget there. You also lead a group called Moya? Yeah, this was a a UK consortium trying to work out the global methane budget. Now, Budget means that you've got a lot of sources, things emitting, and you've got a lot of sinks, which are things destroying. And if they're in balance, then methane's flat. But if the sources go up or the sinks come down, then methane starts growing. Now, through the 1980s, methane was growing very fast. But we could also see that the types of carbon in the methane, are you familiar with carbon isotopes? You get uh, the common carbon isotopes, carbon-12, but there's also perfectly natural uh, stable isotope, carbon-13, which is just a small amount of the carbon. And then up at the top of the atmosphere, you get carbon-14, which is the radioactive one that's made. That's also natural, but there's, there's very little of it. And so what we noticed... In fact, you can go back in in snow bubbles and ice core bubbles, is that over the last couple of hundred years, the methane in the atmosphere has been getting relatively richer in carbon-13. It's a slight change, but it's quite obvious. And that carried on up to about the year 2006. A very simple answer. Um, We were digging up a lot of coal and burning it, and also oil and gas fields. And fossil fuel methane tends to be a bit richer in the carbon-30. And that's exactly what methane did up to about 2006. Um, It grew until the late 1990s, and then it flattened out. And it looked like methane had equilibrated, that the sources matched the sinks. Then in 2006, the end of 2006, beginning of 2007, something new happened. You got a new curve, and this new curve is 
concave instead of convex. And we notice at the same time that the isotopes, methane was now getting richer in carbon-12 again. And what likes carbon-12 is biology. Biological sources of methane, that includes wetlands. They make a lot of methane, particularly bubbles in swamps. And now, cow is a walking wetland, so cattle as well. Landfills, sewage plants, biodigesters, they all make carbon-12 rich methane, or slightly more carbon-12. And that trend starts reversing this um, carbon isotope trend of 200 years. It's going the other way. And the growth has accelerated. It took off in 2007 to about 2012-13. Then it accelerated again. And then in 2020, it really started rocketing. And in the last few years, we've had higher growth rates than even in, in the really height of the beginnings of the, the Soviet Union's gas industry in the early 1980s. Something you, very remarkable is happening. And you mentioned different sources of biological methane. You, you said cattle. You said um, it could be thawing permafrost as, as plants rot and so on. Yeah. Uh, are you? Do you know yet what sort of proportions they could be? Or yeah, well that that's our puzzle. I was actually back in the nineteen eighties, the first person along with somebody in in the states to point out the problem with the permafrost and also the methane gas hydrates and. NOAA ran a, a, a superb global network of remote sites where they get flasks of air from around the world. This is the US government, National Ocean and Atmosphere Administration. And they're sent to Boulder, and they're all analysed together so that you know that you've got carefully compared samples. So we know that in some years, the Arctic does appear to lead, for example, in 2007. But in most years, actually, the the leading growth has been in the tropics or the subtropics, which is actually the biological heart of the planet. Okay. We get samples in our lab from regularly from Spitsbergen and from northern Canada. We're watching the Arctic very carefully. But all over the world, methane is a bit different from CO2 because it's got sources all over the world. And in some ways, it's a, a, an integrating signal for the health of the entire biosphere. When you talk about the Arctic, Siberia has an awful lot of um, permafrost. Yeah. We, you obviously can't access that now, I'm assuming. with the um, Yes and no, because um, the wind carries no passports. Um, <laughs> we've, uh, for example, we've um, in the past, we've measured emissions from the Congo, which is another place that's difficult to get to, in Ascension Island. You just fly up a drone 3,000 metres, 10,000 foot above Ascension Island, and you can sample the Congo. Likewise, we've flown in the Moya project and, and also in a previous project before this, this Moya project, we flew flights up in the Arctic up to Spitsbergen. And so you can get wind that comes across the Arctic and pick it up. The wind circulates. And this is why we get regular samples from Spitsbergen. And the uh, Canadian government maintains a station at Alert in northern Canada. There are other places to um, the American Barrow in Alaska. So we're watching the Arctic pretty closely. When you start picking apart these biological sources, if you're talking about vast areas of land in the Arctic, there's not much we could do really at the moment to intervene and, and stop that, I don't think. The Arctic's big, and I've, I've been over an awful lot of it. Uh, it's huge. But then the biological factory of the planet is the tropics. Is yeah. that somewhere we can actually really make a difference, do you think? Um What's different? What we're worried about in the methane budget is feedbacks. Methane at the moment, I'm, I'm being very, very rough here, about 60% of the emissions are from human beings, and that includes the coal, oil, and gas industries, recently particularly actually growth in coal. Then there's landfills and biodigesters are horrifically leaky, um, and things like that, and sewage. And then, of course, there's our agriculture, northern agriculture. But then you look at the natural emissions, and in natural emissions, they come primarily from wetlands, and particularly big tropical wetlands. Africa's got some enormous wetlands in the Congo Basin, in the Nile Basin, the Zambezi, and also some of the interior basins of, of Africa. And then in Amazonia, both in Brazil and northeast Bolivia, very, very big wetlands. 
So in Moya, we flew some flights in in northeast Bolivia and got enormous emissions. Um, and in southern Bolivia and um, Brazil, there's the Pantanal, which is one of the world's biggest wetlands. And these tropical wetlands, they're much warmer than the Arctic wetlands. And essentially, methane production depends on essentially how big the wetland is and how warm and wet it is. So the tropical wetlands are, are producing a, a really huge amount. We flew over something called Lake Banguiulu. It's a large wetland and lake in, um, in the Congo, upper Congo Basin. It's actually in Zambia, so you can access it. The Zambian government was extremely helpful to us. Now, Banguiulu, the wetland is 10,000 square kilometers or so. It, it varies depending on season. It emits about very roughly about as much methane as Britain. That's serious. We flew over the northeastern Bolivian Amazonian wetlands, and they were emitting maybe twice as much methane. Now, if these places get warmer and wetter, they're going to respond very, very quickly to um, climate change. So you get feedbacks. And then if you look at what happened at the end of the ice ages, that's exactly what appears to have happened, that the wetlands, particularly in Africa, suddenly switched on methane emission. Essentially, more things, more papyrus grows. It rots very quickly, and the rotting vegetation, it actually, a lot of it, the methane actually channels up the papyrus, and then emits to the atmosphere, and you get this very, very fast, fast, I mean decades, not, not centuries, Feedback. The wetland gets wetter and um, there's more rain, it's warmer, it grows a lot more uh, swamp, and the swamp rots and makes a great deal more methane. Does this feedback, is this a signal of the biological sources almost overtaking the man-made sources? Well, this would explain the shift to isotopically light methane. Not that the biological sources are overtaking them, but the growth in the biological sources is driving methane's current growth. So it's the it's the extra oomph. There seems to be very strong feedback into these tropical wetlands, particularly the African tropical wetlands. And that's linked to things, I don't know if you've heard of the Indian Ocean dipole. It's a bit like El Nino, but it's in the Indian Ocean. So there have been extremely wet years in, in parts of moist tropical Africa. It, that's also linked up with the La Nina um, events as well. It's not just there because you can't really tell the difference between a cow and a wetland. Now, African wetlands are full of cows anyway. What we tried to do was to say there has been this shift to biological methane since 2006. The growth has, has been dominantly biological. There's been some fossil fuel growth, but not. it's mainly biological. The number of cows in America, fat cows in America and Europe and so on, maybe has increased a bit. We tried to quantify that, but there was still left a huge amount that seems to come from somewhere else and seems to come from the tropics. And what is that? And the most likely explanation is that a huge amount of the recent growth is from wetlands uh, or things associated with wetlands and possibly also more grass and you know, fatter cows in the tropics. And also to some extent, um, Arctic boreal wetlands, particularly in, in Canada and Siberia. So our conclusion was that there are very, very strong feedback factors working here. Okay. But tropical wetlands and also Arctic wetlands or, or boreal wetlands, which means Canadian forest also, are essentially turning on. Now, that's a feedback effect to human-induced climate warming. Okay. And if we go back to the beginning when you were saying that um, – the impact of methane compared to CO2, for example, is a short-lived sort of decadal yeah. air heating. If we look at the, the time frames we're trying to operate on the broader political scale of 2030, 2050, this kind of thing, this kind of starts to matter, doesn't it, if, if we're seeing this rise? Here's the scary bit, which was what we were looking at recently. We said, when's this sort of thing happened in the past? Now, we do have a past analogy. It's it's very different. Methane's now going, it's up there over 1,900 parts per billion, and we've got a, a, a warm planet. But if you go back to the last ice age, when methane was, say, 350 parts per billion, 
and it suddenly jumped up to 750. How did that happen? And the, the most recent event was some, at the end of something called the Younger Dryas, which was a cold spell, particularly in, in um, Europe and North America. And the, the climate change then took place in a couple of decades. There was one decade where the interior of Greenland seemed to warm by about 10 degrees. Huge, rapid changes on a decadal scale. And we said to ourselves, is there a comparison and these events that take you out of ice ages are known as terminations. That, that's the scientific name. A termination has a, a, a sort of starting period and then this very sharp climb and then a long, long tail when all the ice, not all the ice melts, but at least the ice over Stockholm or somewhere melts. So in a full termination, it may take many thousands of years. But in the middle of that, there's this abrupt phase, which is a very, very sharp jump. And that only takes a few decades. You think um, there's a likelihood that we could be entering this abrupt phase? Well, when we tried to compare the two records, they look very similar. Now, that abrupt phase in methane is a feedback on, uh, seems to be a feedback on wetlands. That the wetlands get going, they turn on very sharply, and they emit a huge, you know, they have a wonderful time. They have lots of. Uh, growth of papyrus and things like that in the tropics, and also to some extent in Russia. And so there's very, very quick feedback-driven transitions. Basically, it gets warmer, emits more methane, gets warmer, and, and so on. And that does look like what's happening. Okay. And so we yeah. simply ask the question, can that comparison be made? If so, are we in one of these termination events? And if we are in one of these termination events, if you... If you take the last one of 12,000 years ago, that was going from an ice age to an interglacial period, which has been good for humans, especially, but other yeah, not so well. good if you happen to be a fish in the sun <laughs> uh, around Antarctica, but yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. But for humans, I mean, we've benefited. Now, if we're going into a hotter world, it's, it's a bit of a problem for us. Isn't it? And we're starting to see that now. I think that when you say abrupt, I mean. Well, that's exactly our question. Was it, methane is a proxy for the state of the entire planet. You know, it basically integrates things all over the planet.